Welcome, everybody. New faces, old faces, fishy faces. Did you do your fish face? No. So we have a couple things that I usually go through before we get started. Um, we'll get into the seminar real quick. If you didn't register when you came in, I would advise it. We have a loyalty program. If you sign up for that, after five visits to our store, you get 15% off on your next visit, and it will register. You'll get a coupon sent to your phone. No spamming. The other is a um, event notification. So we will notify you via text for any of our events coming up. You won't get spammed, but it'll be our fishing seminars. We have an expo in the spring that's huge. We usually have 50 plus vendors. We have speakers all day long. We also do um, some other things like we'll have a fall showcase coming up October 13th. We're gonna showcase new boat products. We're gonna have vendors here. We'll have some people doing some speaking but we'd love to have you. So we want you guys to know, be notified of events that we have going on. We have a huge Facebook presence right now, so we're doing a lot of promotions on there. So if you wanna get signed up, we've done some fun things lately. We've had pictures of dogs on boats. We're giving away VHF radios. We're giving away $200 inflatables. We're doing a lot of fun stuff right now. So if you can, follow us on Facebook. It's a good idea. Um, as you came in, you received a blue raffle ticket. Okay, so we got a bunch of raffles to go give away this evening. We also have what's the loyalty card. So this is super cool and it's really important. Every fishing seminar that you guys attend, we will go ahead and give you a punch. Tonight's was if you brought a friend, you get a second punch. Once you get five punches, you're entered to win into a raffle to win a charter with your favorite captain. Now, I know you guys are all going to say Alex is your favorite captain. <laughs> just because I'm standing right here. Because he's right here. I understand, but I understand. Anyway, so that's some good what guys around. Is, <laughs> that's what this is for, you know. So you guys might have the opportunity to win. If not, if it's somebody like uh, Jim Ross or something like that. We still love him <laughs> we anyway. We love us some Jimmy Ross. We, we do. So these are important. Um, I've also placed some items up here. Um, if you want a flyer from tonight's event, feel free to grab yourself one. We also have an event coming up Saturday, which is called Hot Dogs, Hot Deals. Simply what it states. We're going to be running some specials. We have like $2,000 off on our Fish 190 jet boats. We have financing specials. We have extended warranties for like an additional three years. So there's a lot of fun things that are going on. 11 to 1, you get free hot dogs, music, raffle, and drinks. So it's kind of a cool thing to come out to. If you happen to be driving a by, just stop in, say hi, and enter yourself for the raffle. It's a VHF Marine radio. So you're looking at a few hundred dollars just to stop by, grab a hot dog, and sign up. Perfect. Um, I think tonight we want to introduce some of our sponsors. We have Hello. Space Fish here. Um, they're one of our gracious sponsors. And our other sponsor is Seto. We usually do Stella and Jeff out of Canaveral, Port Canaveral. They sponsor the pizza and the drinks. So if you say hello, hi, shout out on Facebook to them, they would love it. So tonight with Seto, you guys, Red Snapper season starts when? Friday. 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 Okay. So if you don't have Seto and you go out for Red Snapper and you break down, it's $400 an hour from the time they leave the dock. Right? So that can get expensive. You're looking at like a $1,200 bill by the time you're done. $149 for an annual membership. Okay, so it pays for it. If you call Jeff and Stella and say, hey, I want to sign up by Thursday morning because it takes 24 hours to go in effect, they will give you two extra months of coverage before snapper season starts. So that was their, their little plug tonight. So if you need it, it's a good time to get it. You get some free extra coverage with it. I'm going to go ahead and let you speak a little bit about our space fish, and then we'll get started with um, Captain Alex. Hey guys, uh, yeah, my name is John, and I'm with Space Fish, and I just want to say, like Kara just touched on, uh, yeah, red snapper season. It's going to be a bloodbath this weekend out there, and uh, yeah, it wouldn't hurt to have some CETO membership. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Space Fish, but yeah, we got a website, and we started about six months ago in January, and you know. It's kind of a weekly fishing report, but we're trying to kind of be more than that and be a community, like an online representative of the local fishing community here. And we're really evolving. It's really cool. We got uh, so many contributors 
from recreational anglers like you guys to professional guides like the legend himself over here, Alex Gorichke. And uh, yeah, we, we just want to bring everyone into the fold and check out what we're doing. We're spacefishreport.com. Anybody who wants a sticker, you can come up and grab one at the end and uh, there's enough for everybody. And yeah, check us out, follow us on Facebook. And back to what Kara was saying also, yeah, you know, just liking her stuff on Facebook, even if you're not going to go to the hot dog fest, it spreads the word and does a lot for the business. So it, it's nice, it's nice. And uh, it's just good to see you guys out here. And uh, yeah, enjoy uh, the seminar from Alex because a lot of people pay good money for this. I would. I've been following them for years. Six years? Couple years. Still dying to go on a trip with them, but you won't take me on that. <laughs> Without right. further ado, you guys ready to get this going? Yeah. Okay, okay. So, much, uh, much like uh, they said, thank you to all the sponsors and everything like that for letting us get out here and uh, talk to you folks about different types of fishing. I've done several different seminars now for Boaters Exchange, from kayak fishing for big tarpon off the beach to everything you could think of. Um, my name is Captain Alex Gorichke. I've been running Local Lines Guide Service or LocalLinesCharters.com for 10 years now on the Space Coast. I was born and raised in Merritt Island, Florida, up on North Merritt Island on Pine Island Road. Basically did everything to not do anything but fish uh, or go surfing. It was basically my life and it kind of transitioned right over. I did a bunch of odd jobs from aerospace technician to pizza maker and everything in between, but I uh, figured out that guiding was the way I should go with my life. Uh, one thing I've always done is kind of gotten myself uh, a little bit further into the biology and the reasons why, as opposed to just, I'm going fishing, let me get some shrimp and go fishing today. Um, I'm kind of a person that's taken in time and read into and looked into um, all the different things that make certain types of fish or certain types of fisheries kind of click. And uh, one of our premier fisheries, especially now on the Space Coast, uh, because we've had such a hard time with the lagoons around here, um, is the fall mullet run. And it is, by name, kind of not explained correctly. It's not a run, it's a migration. It is a full migration of mullet. And um, it's kind of hard to uh, grasp the concept of that this is happening as a fall situation when it's about 95 degrees outside. And it'll probably still be 95 degrees outside when the first waves of mullet run through. Typically with this migration, what we do is look at it at the, round, the, the last week or last couple weeks of August, and then from there on out, we're looking for that migration to start. Um, what, what they're doing or what the reason why there is even a migration um, is a pretty simple process. Here, we don't have cold fronts yet, but pretty much as soon as the end of August happens, the southeast states, Carolinas, Georgia, all those places start getting little cold fronts that troop right across the state and out off the coast. We'll never see a change in the weather here whatsoever, but there they start seeing autumn changes. They start seeing leaves starting to kind of do their thing. Well, for us, we don't get none of that. What we get is the mullet coming down the beach. So. As those cold fronts push and you have all those backwater areas from the Carolinas all the way down to Georgia and even North Florida, as those cold fronts start pushing off, what you get is a mass migration of mullet. Mullet have a, just like all fish, have a temperature range where they're comfortable. So every species has a different range. Uh, just this last winter, we had a little issue north of us with snook and tarpon. Snook and tarpon, if it gets below 54 degrees for more than a few hours, let alone a few days, in the water, they're done. They'll die. Mullet obviously have a significantly larger uh, a range of temperature, but still, they're considered more of a, a temperate subtropical species of fish. Snook, tarpons, they're considered more of a tropical species of fish. So that allows those mullet to slide themselves up north they spawn up there, babies in the spring and the whole nine yards, and, well, late in the spring and into the, through the summer. And as those cold fronts go through, they realize, oh my gosh, it's going to get way too cold here for me to stay. I can't be here. This isn't what I need to do. And an, an, an instinctual uh, reaction to that is leave the backwaters, hit the ocean, 
take a right at the beach and head south and keep on heading south until you can't head south no more. And what that ends up making is a migration of mullet. And if you've never seen the physical mullet run in action, it's a pretty uh, spec it's a spectacular sight. Um, you can stand on a beach and from your feet to 150 yards out, it's solid mullet. And as far north as you can see, it's solid mullet. As far south as you can see, it's solid mullet. That isn't every single day. That isn't every single minute that you walk out in the mullet run. However, if you take the time during that time period, you're going to see those instances where it is a just a massive amount of fish, and they are all going in one direction. So what does this really mean for us? Obviously, everything that eats fish, or everything, every fish that eats other fish is going to take advantage of a situation like that. It's a massive amount of bait. It's a constant, consistent wave after wave after wave. Fish are able to sit. They're able to eat. A lot of times this is uh, uh, ways for fish to fatten up before they're getting ready to go into a time of lean. They know that the winter time is a time of, time of lean. It's a time that there isn't as much bait around. Menhaden, croakers, everything, everything, not just mullet, kind of get a little shifty and move around and find their wintering areas. And that might not be where it's comfortable for a big old snook or a full-size tarpon or something like that. So with the snook, as soon as right now, literally as we speak, even though the moon's not right, so they're not physically doing it right now, they're spawning in all of the inlets, basically from Sebastian Inlet South, um, all the way down to the Palm Beaches. Every one of those inlets has spawning snook in it. Same with the West Coast, although they're having their issues right now. So that's obviously affecting that greatly. Um, as those snook expel all that energy, and they do eat while they're spawning, they eat in those inlets, there's plenty of food, but that's a, a massive amount of energy that they put out for months at a time when they're doing these spawning activities. Um, right on the heels of that, Literally, as they're done doing their spawn, here come the mullet. And it's their chance to fatten up. Uh, the large tarpon that we love to catch in the summertime. This summer was a little, eh, wasn't so good for it. We didn't have the pogies at all this year. Well, what happens is those tarpon are on a migration too. They're headed up to the Carolinas, believe it or not, about where these mullet are going to be coming from. Well, for us, usually the, po the pogies kind of tend to keep them here when we have a good summer. Didn't happen. It is what it is. Those tarpons, our next shot, our only last shot until next summer, is when they chase down the schools of large mullet. They'll follow them all the way down to South Florida, and even further than that, because tarpon end up wintering over down past the Keys and the Tortugas and in the Caribbean. They push all the way down and then come back up every year, the large full-grown tarpon. So that migration doesn't just mean only mullet are going. It means just about everything's getting up, getting moving. It's a change of seasons. Anytime you have a change of seasons, everything starts happening. Obviously, there's certain stars of the mullet run uh, that stand out. You can go at any point in time to Port Canaveral during this period of time, or Sebastian Inlet, or anywhere on the beach, and catch just a gazillion different types of fish. Everything from ladyfish to jacks to reds and um, all, all, everything in between. But one that really, really stands out and the one that we're going to focus on for the purpose of this, other than just the physical movement of the mullet, is snook. Snook fishing is by far one of my favorite things to do when the mullet run gets going. Um, like I said, they're waiting for it. They know it's coming. They've spent the last four months, two months, three months spawning hard. They're ready to eat. And it's usually a show when they get going on some mullet, as the mullet are moving either through a trough on the beach, around a, a jetty, or something of that nature. Um, there's multiple ways you can fish the mullet run for snook or any fish. Uh, and realistically, even with uh, you know something in the nature of, of uh, fishing a mullet run scenario where you have multiple species of fish, what you want to do is, is tackle up for the actual occasion. Because you don't want to end up over tackling yourself for something that could be really fun. And we'll get deeper into the tackling stuff um, 
once we kind of kind of get past that hump of where we're going to be going actually looking for certain different types of fish snook not just different types of fish but different types of actual snook so i say different types of snook they're not different fish but certain fish seem to like certain areas and not every uh, jetty or every section of every jetty is going to have the snook sitting in it there's going to be prime spots where those snook are going to almost muscle out any other fish to where most of the baits that go in you're hooking a snook and those spots are going to be your prime time spots and they're going to be the as soon as you realize that it's going on those are going to be where you want to go right away so this migration of mullet and when i said the big you know the big tarpon are chasing the big mullet there is literally everything from three inch mullet all the way up to four and five pound silver mullet you have or a uh, black mullet you have both black and silver mullet in the run everything comes out everything slides south and it continuously slides south so in that foray of every size mullet possible you're gonna have every size fish possible chasing those baits down with it um, our general area here has some unique features Canaveral, uh, the tip of the Cape if you're on boat, um, along the beaches, whether you're on foot or kayak, Port Canaveral is unique on the entire East Coast. And does anybody know why? No? It's the only inlet with a lock system. Yeah. As those mullet come down, it is the only one that's not free flowing. It's basically like a big swimming pool for them to stop and relax. So this migration of mullet they get shoved out of their backwater area where they're nice and happy up in the carolinas they get shoved out onto the beach when they get shoved out onto the beach they go from being mr mullet that lived on a on a side of a ditch in the back waters to little little tiny fish in really really big pond freaks everybody out and they just they get that subtly kick to them and they go and they keep going south well as that's happening instead of what their life was up until that point was slow maybe a little bit tidal movement maybe a little bit chop every now and then now they're in the waves now they're 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 victims of the ocean basically there's a lot more water moving it's a lot more uh, stressful for them to actually make that swim you got to think of it like a mullet you're a little mullet this big and you got to make it to the keys from north carolina you got a lot of swimming to do in between here and there you know <laughs> you got to keep on trucking and no matter what you keep on rolling um, however, you're going to have instances where you physically can't do it. Can't do it. I mean, if it's blowing 45 out of the south because there's a hurricane coming up, it's not going to work. You can't swim against that. It doesn't work. And we'll find, and that's why with the mullet run, you need to, to kind of not just be looking for an exact weather scenario, more or less just let me keep my rods in the fishing or my rods in the vehicle for a month and a half <laughs> and anytime i get a chance to even run down to the beach for an hour i'm going to go take a run down to the beach for an hour and that's really what it boils down to because anything a southerly wind in the middle of a good push of mullet that's a good hard south wind can instantly stop that mullet run and shut it down and you won't see a single mullet roll down the beach until that wind stops and they start picking up and going back like i said though port canaveral is kind of unique if they end up at, at Sebastian Inlet, or if they end up up at Ponce, or uh, up in Jacks, or anywhere like that, and it's nasty outside, they can't make headway against that surf, they need to get in somewhere. They go take a right-hand turn into one of those inlet, inlets, and it's like, whoosh, I'm in. You know, or it blows them out into the middle of the ocean, they swim against it as hard as they can. When they take a right turn here at Port Canaveral, it's like, ah, relaxation, we can chill out. We can make our way around for a little while. We can wait till it calms down. So in areas like Ponce, and I'm just using this as a, because this is kind of a central location, Ponce or Sebastian, some of their best fishing happens when it turns from nice, perfect mullet run or cruising down, mullet runs happening, baits cruising down the beach, um, and it turns nasty. And those baits try to get into that inlet and try to get into that lagoon and try to hold up and try to basically ride out the weather is what they're looking to do. Um, Port Canaveral doesn't have that tide, doesn't have that hard ripping flowing current. So what you get in there is just mass amounts of bait 
that are just kind of milling around everywhere from the middle of the port to under every single wharf and wrapping around the jetties and it's funny you can actually watch these mullet and if if you could tag one i'm sure you can tag one with a little radio tag at the front of the port just north of it you would watch that mullet come in the port even on a good normal just mullet run day most of them come around the tip of the north jetty and don't go straight across most of them hug the jetty and come right inside and they go inside, and then they go into the east basin, then they go into the west basin, then they go into the or the middle basin, the west basin, then they hit the locks, they turn around, they come right up the other side, and head out the south jetty and keep going. And it takes a day and a half for them to make that pass through. And you could literally watch, if you could say, this is my purple mullet that I'm going to watch the whole way, or something like that. You could watch that mullet just do 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 the whole way through, and then right back down south. They're on a mission, and they're on a mission to get to where they need to be during the winter or they die, you know. Here, we're kind of in that break zone to where we even have warm years where the mullet run kind of seems to stop here almost or it, you know, kind of peters out and, and floods south of us a little bit, but we hold a lot of our mullet. Our mullet don't leave. They hold up in the lagoon, they hold up in the canals and stuff like that. Typically, when we have a real fall where we have cold fronts that push through and it's, it feels like falls here, um, even our mullet will get a little shifty. They'll look for their place that they've got a winter over, their canal or whatever. If they're not comfortable, they head out and head south too. So, with this massive migration of bait fish, um, like I said, my favorite one of all that's going to be attacking them is going to be the snooks. And one of my favorite tactics, we'll just jump into the, the best way to do it personally in my book, is getting out onto the beach. And when I say the beach, I mean literally walking out on the sand. Uh, anywhere from Port Canaveral, anywhere, literally anywhere where the mullet are running down that beach, you have a very good chance at catching snook or catching fish, period. Um, some of the hot spots for us around here are obviously down north of Sebastian Inlet. is all real good areas. Anywhere up here in Canaveral is usually really, really good, all the way to about the pier. Um, and then again, uh, Satellite Beach, in the Atlantic, those areas where you have the rocky outcroppings and such like that can get really, really, really good. Um, for us, our snook aren't coming off of spawn. They can't spawn. They can try to spawn, but we don't have enough water movement at Port Canaveral. Technically, Sebastian Inlet's supposed to be the northern, northernmost spawning site. The last few years have been pretty warm, although last year got a little cool. And there's spawning size snook up in Ponce Inlet right now. And I'd be pretty shocked, actually, if they weren't trying to do something. Because all they need is the heavy flowing water of an inlet and the right moon phase, basically, to do their thing, for the most part. There's got to be enough of them around to obviously do it. Um, but we've seen these populations of fish start sliding north a bit. Um, certainly the snook have done it. Uh, juvenile, snook, or juvenile tarpons have also done it, too. Um, when you go to do this beach fishing, my favorite part about it is we get to leave this stuff at home. And these may not look huge, but it's a 5,000 and a 6,000. One's on a lighter rod and one's on a real beefy rod. Um, we leave that stuff at the house. And we take out river, river tackle. A little 4,000 reel, a nice little light rod, or something like that, and have fun with the fish. As opposed to everywhere else where you catch a nice snook, and you are battling for your life against some kind of tree or some kind of wharf piling or some kind of rock outcropping or something that that snook was living on that he's bound and determined to wrap you around and break you off on after you hooked them. This, for the most part, except for as you get down south towards Sabat or down towards uh, Satellite and Indian Atlantic and uh, in those areas with the rocks, um, this can all be accomplished with a 4,000 and a light rod and some. 15 pound braid or 10 pound braid. It's really, really super fun fishing. There's nothing for them to break you off on. All you have to worry about is the mouth chafe or a gill cut. And other than that, you can fight that fish. You can play out a 40 pound snook on this rod right here and have a blast doing it. Take you a little while, um, but you're gonna have a good time doing it. And it's not gonna be any problem for you gear wise. Whereas if you hook a 40 pound fish on the jetty with this, you're smoked. You won't even come tight on that fish probably before it has you in a around, actually it'll probably take you around the whole jetty. 
just because it could at that point in time. You have no, no backbone to stop a fish. You know, the reel doesn't produce enough drag to even come close to it. Your line's a little too light anyways. Um, so we'll go over the, the terminal rig for anything that I do um, when I'm doing this beach stuff. And when I talk about the beach, it, it, is, it, it is truly it's tough to do in a boat. Um, so it is truly something you do on your feet. You throw a rod and a handful of lures in your car and you have it ready and you run down there and you take a couple casts if the mullet are rolling through. If the mullet aren't rolling through, you take the walk down the beach and you call it a walk on the beach and go home. You know, it's a pretty easy process. This stuff right here, I usually use a 30. I'm doing nothing but a uni to uni knot, 30 pound mono or 30 pound fluoro to whatever I want to throw at these fish. Um, if it's calm enough, and if it's actually clear enough and clean enough, a lot of times I like throwing, even this is a up, this is a little bit smaller. This is an upgraded size. Sometimes they're in there eating on minnows and stuff like that and you can't get them off of them and having a smaller, or the really <coughs> little mullet are rolling through. So it doesn't have a, a hurt to have multiple sizes of your plastics. And this one's a three and this one's a four and a half. Um, even with this though, if it gets really rocking and rolling out there on the beach, these get a little too lost, and it's got a heck of a thump to the tail, a lot of vibration, great lure to throw, but when it gets really rocking and rolling, it's a little tougher to, uh, I think personally, for that fish to find it in that surf zone. And when I talk about the surf zone, I'm talking about literally the roll and the waves. A lot of people want to get down to the beach, and you get to the beach, and you get set up, you got your lures or whatever, there's mullet rolling through, and you're like, all right, I'm gonna do this. And you walk right down to the edge of the water, right straight down, and you start just, yow, crack and cast out as hard as you can. Cast after cast after cast, straight out to the ocean, reeling it back in. Um, and you, you are fishing, but you are not necessarily effectively fishing. Certainly not necessarily effectively fishing that piece of water that you're standing in front of. With a beach, just about everything is linear. All your troughs, all your sandbars, all of it kind of run this way. You'll have gaps that run through things, yes, but everything's linear. So if you're standing here and I'm on the edge of the water and I'm casting out and about midway through all you people, there's a nice, nice sandbar, there's a little trough, maybe another sandbar right here, and then another trough and it's to me. You know, my cast is, you know, I get shots at two troughs, about, you know, five foot wide or so. And those troughs are typically going to be where that fish is going to want to sit down, wait for bait to come, explode up. So that trough is where those fish are going to be concentrated in. So it's where you should concentrate your cast. Well, if I'm flinging that thing straight out, I'm only getting five foot of that trough every time I come across it. If I simply, and I'm going to walk this way, throw that thing that way, well, I effectively run through 30 foot of each one of those troughs on each cast. So when you cast horizontally to a beach and you retrieve your lure, you are bringing it through the strike zone for a much, much longer time. Much longer time. A lot of times, and I would not recommend this at all if it's really, really fishy, because I've seen too many sharks with their belly on the sand and their tail, whack, 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 mullet flying everywhere because they flat beach themselves eating mullet in that deep of water. So don't go wading in the mullet run if it's really going on. <laughs> it's, not, it's not good for your legs at all. But, um, but to get into the water just a little bit, if it's not you know, crazy time, and, and gives you a little even more effective of a horizontal cast to that beach. And what I typically do, no matter where I'm fishing, is cast what I call, call class, cast the clock, especially if I'm blind fishing. I don't know exactly what I'm going for. Six o'clock, five o'clock. 2 o'clock, blah, blah, or 6 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 2 o'clock, da, 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 all the way around. And then repeat, and then repeat. So you're on a beach, and you've got everything from your 9 to your 3 all in front of you. You can cast dun, 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 dun. I can guarantee you it's going to be those casts right there that are probably going to be the most productive. Those straight out casts, although you do get through that trough for a little while, are a lot shorter of a time period working it through the prime strike zone of those beach fish. Um, 
Like I said, these soft plastics, when it's not too rolled up, when it's not too churned up, are great. They're really fun to use. Um, when it is starting to get a little bit nasty out, a little bit tougher, um, another thing that's really fun, it's the only time I'll use this except for in the port because the water's calming it. This thing, if you throw it in even just a, like a two-foot breaking wave, is lost. You can't see it. Um, neither hardly can a fish. Uh, the big poppers sometimes work a little better, but the, the, the strike to actually hook fish ratio starts going way down the top water or you are. Um, but it is fun when it's real flat and there's a lot of mullet moving. You go throw a nice big top water with a big rattle in it and uh, everything in the world is going to come take a swing at that thing. It'll at least be fun to watch, you know. And uh, you'll get a chance at a snook here and there. But one of the most effective lures for us for doing the walking the beach, and I just threw it on here so I could have it, um, because this isn't a rod that I'd be throwing. I would be throwing that light rod. Unless I was up near the pier or down by the... Uh, those rocks, I would step up to this 5,000 with a little bit beefier rod, something that I can actually put some pressure on a fish and turn them if I need to turn them. Um, a simple little lip plug. Anything from this is a little uh, Rapala rip and slash or something like that that I, I uh, put the VMC inlines on. Um, anything from your standard bomber with the three hook to the broken back to wing cheaters any lip plug the only thing that i think is a requirement which there is no requirements in fishing it's all take a guess and take a wing at it pretty much 100 percent um one of the things that i look for in a plug if i'm going to do this is a floater i don't really necessarily like a sinking plug mostly because there isn't going to be anywhere in that cast that it's more than a couple four or five foot deep if you're at dead high tide you might have eight foot of water or something like that, but still, even up, up in the trough area, in the, that horizontal area, you're still going to be ripping it through <coughs> one to maybe four foot is your uh, kind of thing. So if you get one of those real big lip deals that's heavy weighted, that's meant to dive 25 foot, you'll just be, you'll be picking up seashells all day long. Literally, it'll be like uh, the shrimp guys that are trawling the bottoms for shrimps or something, shrimp jumping everywhere. This guy right here, this little one's a floater. So even if I do feel like um, maybe on the inside I've gotten real tight in there and there's fish busted tight on the shore, I can see them, physically see snook working that edge right in at my feet and I want to work this plug along that edge, well, what you can do with a floater is you can pause it. Crank, 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 pause. It floats up. Crank, 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 pause. Floats up. Crank, 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 pause. It floats up. So it gives you an opportunity to work this thing even in super, super shallow. Oddly enough, we were talking about Jimmy Ross earlier. He's a big fan of these lip plugs in the lagoon when the mullet are real thick. And you're talking a foot or two foot of water max, throwing a full-blown lip plug. Well, you do it with a floating one. And it's crank, 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 float up. Crank, 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 float up. And it gives it a pretty good motion. So with these floating plugs in that beach, if you're really feeling it dig hard, you can pause your cast for a second. You can pause your retrieve for a second. It'll float up just a little bit, get you off the bottom again, and you can get it going again. It's not bad that this thing's sitting there kicking up shells and sand. Because believe me, that snook's sitting there on the bottom waiting for a fish to come over top of him. If he sees him come right in front of him, he's going to take a swing at him anyways too. It's not bad that this thing's kicking shells and sand. You just don't want it full on you know, digging a trough through the through the sandbar as you come across. You know, you want it to skip across. You know, it's honestly a lot like guys that are throwing these things for bass and bumping them along, bumping them along uh, structure and stuff on the bottom. So with these, strikes might be a little bit more subtle, especially when we're talking snook. For some reason, they get angry at these plugs, man, and they take a freaking swing at it, and they do not, do not usually hesitate. If it's in the zone and if it's in front of them, they both hit it. And snook are a pretty unique fish in that, and that's one of the reasons why the surf zone within the first couple feet, honestly, is typically some of the best fishing. Snook have a unique body shape that allows them to kind of hunker down in current or in, in wave and in wash. And if you take a snook and you look at him, you know, he's got his nice rounded back, but his, his belly's almost flat, or her, is almost a flat. Their pec fins lay almost sideways flat. Their belly from right under their chin all the way to almost their tail 
If you look at it, you can literally stand that fish up like that on the bottom. And their nose, their head is created almost like a foil, almost like a, a, a spoil for a car or something like that. So what that allows them to do is put themselves into a current and it literally sucks them down and holds them there and it pins them. And that's why you see in Sebastian Inlet, when you go diving or snorkeling through Sebastian, they're just lined up across the bottom. They're just sitting there. They're just hanging. They, they're able to, to almost not even exert any energy yet stay there, stay put. And they're meant to be able to work in that wash and they're meant to be able to work in less than perfect environments. Um, snook have one very distinguishing aspect of their body or their look. It's a giant black line down the side. It's not just a marker. It's actually a lateral line. All fish have a lateral line. Flounder have one on the bottom, one on the top too. That lateral line means a lot to a fish. It's, it's basically a sensory organ for them. It's their touch. And it's how they feel vibrations, how they feel changes of pressure, and a lot of different things. Well, there's a reason why a lateral line of a snook's giant black. It's a predominant feature of that fish. It's been evolved over time to be a predominant feature of that fish. It's why they're so effective in feeding in the night. Feeding in the, they don't have a big old giant eye like a tarpon or a, or a deep water species yet. They'll feed all the way through the night. You know, they got a normal, normal size. They have a very, 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 very good ability to feel vibration and feel any kind of movement around them, even in uh, compromised situations in the surf zone. Go, go put on a mask and even and even a tiniest little roll out here, especially around Canaveral or Cocoa Beach and jump in the water and it is black out. You ain't seeing an inch in front of your face, let alone well a fish is in there doing the same thing. It's not Superman eyes or something that can, you know, pierce through, you know, dark water or anything. They use their other senses. They use that smell and the snook use that that lateral line. And that's why a lot of times vibration the lip plug vibrates, got a little rattle, it rattles and da 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 da. It does a really good job. So, beach fishing is easy fishing, it's fun fishing. Go have a good time, throw on a pair of baggies, sunglasses, take a walk down the beach in an evening. So, not a bad way to spend a couple hours. And it's really simple. Like I said, you can honestly have a couple of these soft plastics, maybe one of those plugs in a pocket in one of those little uh, boxes and you can walk down the beach and you have everything you need to have a good time and catch a whole bunch of snook and honestly any species whatsoever. If you want to upgrade that beach fishing, you just upgrade the beach to, to, to live bait and finding an area that is producing for you. And a lot of times actually, what I'll do is if I'm not familiar with a section of beach or whatever, is I'll hit it a handful of times with the lures and go, yeah, you know, every time I roll over this one section of the trough, for some reason, I produce. I get a hit or I get a couple fish or whatever. And I want to go out and see what I can really get out of that hole, what I can really do. And at that time, you go down to the beach with your little cast net, a little bubbler on a bucket, and fill up a, a, a net full of bait, throw them in and, and do that. Um, typically, though, when I'm beach fishing, I don't feel like dragging all the bait and all that stuff down. So I'm almost always going on the lures and just going to have a good time. If I'm really looking to uh, go out and hit that mullet run and, and, and go after some fish, um, I'm going after live bait. And it's super easy to do. If it's working that day, if the mullet run is happening that day, you should have no problem whatsoever catching as many baits as you ever would need in your entire life. So a small cast net, you know, it can be a, it can be a problem actually if you end up having your big old big cast nets. You know, a lot of us have 10, 12 foot cast nets for pogies and such. And if you go throw a 12 foot net on a school of mullet, you're probably never going to get that 12 foot net out of the water without opening it up and shaking it out. So you can go get away with your smaller nets. And a uh, mullet are easy to keep even if you're on the kayak and you don't feel like dragging something. A little bubble or bucket and those things are happy. They're happy for a good long time. Um, even in your boat, if you don't have a fancy live well, a little bubbler or something like that, it'll keep those mullet happy enough for you to use them as bait. And obviously, it's matching the hatch. It's what's going on. It's what everybody's looking for at that moment in time. So it's what you're going to want to use. Not that you can't go get your choice croaker and go throw them on that jetty. And I guarantee you, you're going to hook a snook. It's a snook. He's going to eat a croaker in front of his face. You know? But if you want the consistent, nonstop, this is what's going on right now, 
just go with the mullet. So it's the easy way to do it, but it's almost the right way to do it most of the time. When we're doing that fishing, we are honestly doing no different um, than what we did with the, uh, the rig for this. The only uh, uni to uni, 30 to 40, I very rarely will go to 60. Okay, there's a lot of people that are like, oh, you know, 60 and 40 pound braid and rah, 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 and I'm gonna pull them out of the rocks. Technically, realistically, if he has any of that line taunt up against the rock and you're going it like this, it doesn't matter if it's 120, it's gonna cut. You know, it's a, it's a barnacle. It's a razor blade and taunt line. It's gonna cut. Um, with a snook, the lip abrasion, if you get a big fish, could eventually wear through a 30 or something like that, a really big fish. If you had to fight a fish for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, there's a potential that lip abrasion could rub through. The other way they can get you is with their gill plates. And a lot of people, especially if you haven't actually had the opportunity to get into some, a good snook bite or haven't even had a chance to handle one, mistake their gill for their gill plate. It's, it's halfway up from their actual gill, halfway up the face, you can actually take them by the mouth and push the back of their gill down. It'll pop out right along there. And it is a razor blade. And I don't care if you have 300 pound test, you're not gonna stop a fish from cutting it. So the amount of hits that I get with a 30 or a 40 compared to a 60, where that smart fish, because there ain't no fool in the snook sometimes. Sometimes they're the dumbest fish around. And you put a bait in front of them and they're gonna wallop it. But there's a lot of times where old Mr. Snook's been sitting on that piling for the last four months. And you ain't gonna trick him this time. He's done seen that a thousand times. So you dropping down to a 30 or a 40 might give you a few more hits. And realistically, like I said, that's gonna beat your lip abrasion. You might get a little more second or two on a piling with a 60 compared to a 40. But realistically, if he gets you around that piling and taunt, if he gets you around that gill plate and taunt, you're cut at 120. So going with something that gives you more hits, though you might lose a couple fish, tends to be the way I kind of err on the side of. Don't get me wrong, this one right here is rigged up with 60 and a knocker rig. This was actually a jetty rig, a jetty rod. It got really short. We caught a couple fish and kept shortening it. Um, six off. We were actually using this, um, we were throwing foot long mullet um, about two weeks ago and getting our snook on those. Uh, there were mullet, because mullet are mullet, they swim all over. There's always, almost always some mullet moving around the beach during the summer. Port Canaveral almost always has some big mullet moving around the beaches around it all summer long. Um, and they weren't great for baits for snook. We were actually out there on the jetty, um, throwing lures, throwing plugs. Uh, had a couple of decent hits just from Jackson Blues and stuff. And a school of mullet came around the jetty uh, just as the tide switched and started rolling in. It was dead low tide. As soon as the tide switched, we were sitting on the jetty when the tide switched. And you can't really feel it or see it there. It's not like Sebastian where all of a sudden, there, there we go. Tide switched, now we're in the river. <laughs> you know, it's not like that. I mean, the tide switched because the clock said the tide switched. Um, so what we ended up doing was we're sitting there and the tide switches and all of a sudden some of the mullet that had been up the beach milling around said, all right, we're going to go in the port now. Came right around that corner. It was just a ball of, I don't know, I don't know, 3,000 pounds of mullet. It was a good little, probably half the size of one of these little groups of you guys. All foot long mullet. When they came around that jetty, every snook that we had just been throwing lures on, one after another, we even put, cro we had, I had some croakers, but they were literally bitty croakers. Um, we even put croakers down on them. They didn't get hit by them. Every snook on that jetty instantly went, it's time to eat. And they all came out of the water, all at one time all on those mullet. Mullet went flying, snook went flying, and I immediately grabbed my cast net, started chasing that ball of bait. My client was in a kayak with me, or well, next to me. He just kept casting into the school of bait. Couldn't buy a hit, and there are literally snook doing backflips in front of him, all over, can't buy a hit on a nice plug. Nice, it was actually a wind cheater. It was a bigger plug, um, and couldn't buy a hit, couldn't buy a hit. I got up next to it, threw my net on it, Got like 12 of the 3,000 mullet I must have caught my net out and put them in my boat and hooked up. By that time, the school of mullet had come around the point of the, of the jetty, had come down the jetty about halfway, and then had come off the jetty and started heading into the, to the west, into the port,
but were no longer along the jetty. They were no longer getting smashed one right after, you know, mullet flying everywhere. Client's still casting away. Meanwhile, I'm rigging the big rod, getting ready. All right, come on over here. We went right back to that point, right back to where those, those mullet first came around that corner and when all those snook first went nuts up. Because what those snook were doing, they weren't chasing those fish as they came around the beach. They were sitting there in a group waiting. And when that school of mullet came over them, it was time to eat. They knew that school of mullet was coming because they live on that jetty every single day. They see that school of mullet come by probably every single day as soon as the tide switches to low, or uh, switches coming, starts coming in from low. So we went straight back to where that mayhem happened. Not even a minute of putting a bait down on the bottom in that area, and boom, we were hooked up to a, probably a 20-pound fish. And we ended up getting missing three more fish after that. We got one big good fish and then missed three more after that and went on about our way and did something different. Um, and it was all right in that one spot. You know, those fish chase those, those, those snook chase those mullet a good little ways down that jetty. Until they broke off that jetty and they were done with the jetty, those snook aren't going to leave their home. That's their place. That's where they're hanging out. They turned around, went right back, sat right back down, waiting for another school of mullet to come. We came and put those mullet on top of them and caught a bunch of fish. So with doing your live baiting, having typically... I always have some sort of weight. In here, I'll have my uh, my box of split shots, or my little container of split shots. And then in there, I actually have split shots all the way from the little tiny ones you put on just to sink a shrimp down to uh, some pretty good size split shots. You know, not quite half ounce, but I don't know if I have any real big, big ones in here. A little bit low on the real big, big ones. There's a few in there. But anywhere from you know, your little little tiny split shot to up to a big one works really well to give that bait a little bit of push down. And you would be tempted, because it is very tempting, to just free line a live bait out there right up on the surface and it will get hit. It'll be mixed in with all, all the other mullets and he's going to be hit. Um, typically what we're wanting to do is make our bait stand out a little bit. If you're run if you're in a school of thousands and thousands of bait and your bait looks just like the other thousands and thousands you're waiting for that one in a million chance that the fish is going to take a swing at your bait um, what we typically do to kind of combat that and get us ahead of the game is we'll take that live bait rig we'll take that 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 single hook and we'll put a little split shot i like to put it a good ways up the line for some reason it makes the line drag if you put it right on it he seems to be able to carry it a lot easier and he'll stay up there with his buddies trying to hang out with the school because his best chance of staying alive for the next couple minutes is to be around a whole bunch of other mullet if he's not around those whole bunch of other mullet he's at risk of getting eaten you take that split shot and you slide it down you know 14 inches down the line it seems to drag your line everything down a little bit more and it makes that thing fight a little bit harder and that little bit of weight will drag that bait underneath the school it's typically what you'll have when you have mullet working during the mullet run, you're going to have them right up on the first, you know, couple feet of the surface of the water. So if you're on the beach and it's only ankle deep, well, it's all mullet the whole way through the water column. There ain't no getting underneath those guys, you know, but if you're at that same beach and you're 30 feet off the beach, well, it might be this deep, you know, chest deep. Well, the first couple feet might, or foot might be mullet, solid, you know, layer of mullet. But underneath that, it's just fish waiting to eat them all. So once you get underneath those baits and you're the injured one kind of washing around down there, a lot of times you get picked up quicker. So what we like to do is do that, uh, you know, split shot somewhere in the, uh, we'll actually use this as a stand-in. Split shot somewhere in the 24 inches up, 18 inches up, something like that. And it'll actually drag that bait down. There is, uh, Dennis is going to get mad at me. Sorry, Dennis. That's what I get for being on Facebook Live. Now there's proof. But uh, <laughs> if this thing's hooked in the tail and he's trying to swim away, he's dragging that thing behind him, and it's really trying to pull him down. You know, like I said, if you put it right up on there, he seems to be able to hold that weight a little better. Just like maybe if you had 100 pounds you were trying to drag with a rope 10 feet behind you as opposed to putting 100 pounds on your back and carrying it down the road. 
it's a little easier to do. So this tends to keep them down a little bit lower. One thing that, that I almost always typically do is tail hook my baits um, if I'm sitting still. If I'm really moving, wanting to cast, uh, say working uh, along uh, in the port, maybe working up around some of the wharfs and things like that, uh, then I'll nose hook it so I can actually work that bait more like a lure. A lot like, like this right here would be a mullet there, three aught hook, boom, send them in. I tend to go with three aught, a three aught circle hook for just about everything when we're doing the live baiting. All my baits from fingerling size up to about seven inches or so. If I'm around big bait and I'm around big fish, I'll jump up to a five or six aught. I let the bait determine the size of the hook, not the fish. Most of your modern hooks that you buy that aren't, you know, cheap, cheesy type hooks are more than strong enough to, and capable of handling some really big fish. I've hung giant fish on two aught hooks and one aught hooks. Um, so those hooks can handle it. You size the hook to the bait, not necessarily to the actual fish that you're going to catch. So bigger baits, 10 inch mullet, 10 inch silvers, um, or even bigger stripe mullet, the foot long or bigger stripe mullet, I'll jump up to that six aught. Um, a lot of times, especially if we're into a, the thick of a really, really good mullet run, it does pay off to go get some croakers. Because, you know, if you, uh, the mullet are great, you know, it's like having whatever, a, a good steak joint right next to the house, and you got a pocket full of money every day, and you just go have yourself a filet every night. It's great, love it. You eat filet for about nine or 10 days straight for every meal, and you're going, man, you know, that chicken looks really good right now. Um, you guys got any fish or crab legs back there? Something other than a piece of steak. It's the same thing. Uh, you know, fish will get used to eating the same thing over and over again. They're like, God, give me something different. You send a nice big croaker down, and that, that big mama that's been laying down there is going to come take a pick swing at it. Um, really, with the, uh, the live baiting, um, I'll jump into this rod right here, which was kind of my step-up beach rod. It's a 5,000 with a kind of a medium, more medium action. It's got a little bit of backbone. If I'm not throwing heavy piling stuff and stuff like that, I'll usually go with this, mostly because it throws a bait real easy and real accurate. Um, and it's still got enough backbone. It's like a medium heavy star rod, 5,000 pounds. <coughs> um, if I'm getting into some heavy stuff, I'll break out. This is a, a 6,000. But the difference is, and this is just a pursuit combo, it's nothing, you know, nothing special. It's got, I mean, it's got a lot of backbone to it. It's gonna put a lot of pressure on a fish. It's gonna move a fish pretty well. Um, if I'm fishing really heavy, really big fish and really heavy cover, I'm not scared to go to 8,000 with 50 pound braid on it, but I'll still put 40 or, you know, something on that for the leader. You don't have to go up to 80 pound leader or something like that just because you have heavier tackle. You just need to rig accordingly and be ready. If you guys have any questions at any point in time. What kind of braid do you have on there? So this one is 30, this one is 20, and this one's 10. And it's basically how I have them set up for all my fishing. Um, and these rods right here will double as snook rods, and I'll take them out and play with cobia with them, and, and even mahi and stuff like that. So usually anything in that range. Um, a good 20-pound outfit can kind of get you through both sides of it. Um, something something in a 5,000 range with a good medium heavy rod is something that can kind of do both. Um, you won't kill yourself throwing a plug with this for a couple hours. Something heavy and stiff like that, you're going to feel it after a while of flinging a plug out there and flinging a plug out there and bringing it back in. A lot of guys get fancy with their beach stuff, man. They'll get those 10 foot rods, a bonk, van stall, open face, no bail, all kinds of stuff. Spend $15,000 to go throw a plug on the beach for snow. Not necessary. This will do it perfectly fine. But um, no, those, those rods are very nice. And actually in an area like Sebastian Inlet, um, if, you, if you go and, and watch those guys that are really producing hard somewhere like the Inlet, they're going to have some pretty specialized tackle. And that's because it's a pretty specialized fishery. Um, just like here at Port Canaveral, like I said, is the swimming pool. It's like the jacuzzi where they get to stop and hang out for a little while and relax. Um, the exact opposite to at Sebastian Inlet. When they get wrapped around that, that tip of that jetty, especially on an incoming, they're getting sucked in that inlet and everything's ready to eat them. And there's a lot of water moving. 
and it's a, a lot more specialized of a fishery where those guys with the van stalls and the big long rods that can fling their flare hop 300 yards out and let it skip along the rocks as it, it drifts in um, will produce 100 times the fish you can with any, you know, any of the tactics we're doing here. Um, every single inlet, honestly, as you go to each one, seems to have a different little niche or a different little thing that, that really uh, sets kind of those guys that are doing that stuff apart. doesn't matter if you're Jupiter Inlet, any of those areas, you'll have guys. And, and honestly, the best way to do it is to, to watch them. Go there for a while, stay off to the side, try your little baits, try your little things, and watch what these guys over at Sebastian are doing on that tip of that jetty that's producing fish after fish after fish. And try to at least imitate it in some way, shape, or form, or at least come to your own uh, area or own, own kind of uh, technique that's generally like that. Um, it's not, you know, fishing's, every bit of this is all copying the person before. <laughs> I didn't come up with none of this. It's nothing that I've you know, magically figured out. It's all been written down somewhere or said somewhere or done somewhere. Uh, very rarely does anything new come out and change can, everything. Can you write it down for us? Yeah. <laughs> it's on video now. <laughs> yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for the mullet run, I don't necessarily look uh, for the moon face to make much of a difference except for um, the ability maybe for some fish to be feeding a little heavier at night because it's a full moon and there's a little bit more light or something like that or even a, a lot of times a new moon a darked out moon will get the feed going even harder than a new moon or a full moon will because um, it's blacked out and the fish that have the ability to see then hunt in the dark are at way 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 over an advantage of anybody else um, with the mullet themselves it is 100% in my opinion weather driven has almost nothing to do with moon phase, day of the year, day of the week, time of the day. It doesn't have any, it has everything to do with weather. It has everything to do with those cold fronts starting to push out down or push out the southeast states, which kicks it off. And any uh, any time we typically have a steady weather pattern, whether it's a little light southeasterly or wh whatever it is, if it's steady, usually the mullet runs going steady. The mullet run almost always goes insane the minute you get a north wind on it because everything gets a little extra oomph, gets a little extra push. Everything's moving from north to south. You put a north wind behind all those poor little mullet that are swimming their butts off and they get to cruise in. And a lot of times um, those first cold or first fronts, because <laughs> they're not usually not cold for us, we might get the tail end of that front and we'll see a little westerly or a little northwesterly flatten the beach out a little bit. And a lot of times, that's when it really, really goes nuts. Little north wind, little west wind, northeast wind. Anytime it gets real, real nasty out, like real nasty, I don't go anywhere near the beach. I'll go to the port, I'll hit Sebastian, I'll do something like that, but I'll leave the beach alone because the, the bait's just so blown out and scattered at that point in time. Um, so for me, it's really consistent, steady weather, no matter what it is, just as long as it's consistent, steady. Um, up to a point to where it's just completely mayhem and then it's um you know obviously kind of breaks everything up uh, tropical storms can have a real big influence on it good and bad um, if there's a storm that comes into the carolinas maybe skirts us off the coast and slides in up near the carolina well it can really pop <coughs> things off you get a lot of water flooding out of the backwaters because they get a bunch of rain you got heavy flow coming from north to south it gets everything, the mullet already want to go, it can really pop it off and it can really get it going. That storm could not even give us anything but a little tiny wave, yet it could, in a week and a half from now, when that storm's hitting up there, have every mullet in North Carolina coming by our coast for a, a week and a half to two weeks straight. So paying attention to that, whereas um, we had, uh, which one was it, Matthew or whatever it was that came up, didn't really hit us but it came up real close. I think it was Matthew, one of them. Um, one, of the, one of the more recent ones. Uh, as it came up, we were right smack in the middle of a pretty much firing off mullet run. It was as good as it got right then and there. And uh, it, it was, I think, two years ago, two or three years ago. Um, as it came up, it just sat there and rah, ground up the whole entire East Coast. Still went into the Carolinas, 
but it ground up the whole entire East Coast the whole way, and it virtually shut the mullet run off, and it never turned back on. We had a few little trickles after that here and there, but it, it went from full-blown mullet run to pretty much shutting it off. Um, so tropical storms can have a big influence, negative and actually positive. Um, like I said, if it, if it comes wide of us and doesn't tear up the beach the whole way up and it comes into the Carolinas, even as just a weak tropical storm, those imitate and mimic a lot what you get with a cold front. Um, cold front's not just north wind, cold front's not just verb. Cold front's dropping pressure um, and, and things of that nature that help key, key, uh, key fish off. Um, a tropical storm is super low pressure so it, it, it acts a lot like a cold front. Um, that's how they can kind of get mixed up with nor'easters and stuff in the late season and become the perfect storm that you know most people probably remember the movie of and maybe even remember the storm. Um, you know, that's, that was a tropical low that got mixed with an actual, uh, uh, an actual cold front that came off, a couple cold fronts, I believe, and created a gigantic storm. So those, those weather uh, events low pressures as cold fronts and low pressures as tropical storms imitate each other quite closely so they, they're worth watching moon phase for me doesn't play into it except if i'm you know it's a really bright moon out tonight let's go throw top waters and see what happens you know kind of situation or it's really dark out tonight i bet you those snook on the jetty are just in full sniper mode and they're ready to go off so let's go out there and throw some live baits kind of situation okay any more questions yes yeah, so let's say you're at your favorite beach mm -hmm. Uh, you've got a mullet run that's coming down from north to south. Mm -hmm. The waves are, aren't that strong and the wind is rather light. Would you present your bait up current of, of the mullet and bring it with them or down current and bring it against them? That's a really good question. Typically, I'm going to follow the same pattern of the bait, especially if I'm snook fishing. Because that snook is made, to, like I said, hold down, sit, and wait. It's an ambush predator. Eyes are up. Mouth is up just like a tarp and a trout, any of that. He's looking to feed up. So if that bait comes from behind him, he's got his eyes trained in front at mullet, 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 looking for the one that's not paying attention. And it goes boink, and then out in front of him, what the heck happened there? You know, so chances are the most of, that most of your hits are going to be in that same direction that the flow of bait's going, especially with something like snook. You know, Jack Carvels are in there. Jimmy to Christmas, they're going everywhere. You know, blue fish, they're going everywhere. Uh, even redfish, it, when the redfish get inside the mullets in the, uh, you know, the little slot size or whatever, they're just gonna be in there rah, rah, rah. But snook are, are a little more deliberate in their process. They're gonna be, boom, on the bottom, looking up, going, here comes the mullet, which one's unlucky, which one's unlucky, boom, I'm taking them, is what he's gonna be doing. So a lot of times that, that altering, but that's, being different is not a bad thing, especially when you're trying to get your bait eaten by a fish. So a lot of my lures are gonna imitate mullet. Black bat, white belly. This is an olive bat, white belly. This is a little different, um, the, but it's a black and gold. It's, it's a, a na more natural color, except for the giant chartreuse tail on the back end of it. Um, and they all work great. Sometimes, though, that natural color just keeps on clopping away and not getting touched. And if you go throw a chartreuse plug on that's completely opposite of everything out there, fling it out, it's, it, it'll get cracked. A lot of times doing a, an exact opposite or making yourself stand out, um, i.e. putting the split shot on the bait. So don't not ever cast that way, you know, but your focus should typically be on that stream of mullet. And it doesn't just go for the beach, you know, with that, that stream pouring down, uh, the, the jetty or the inlet. You know, go to Sebastian Inlet and fling your bait down tide. It's probably not going to do much good. You fling it up, it's sweeping down with everything. You know, Port Canaveral, typically those mullet that the fish are watching have a, a almost a predetermined, in their mind, path that they're going to take. They're going to come around, they're going to come down the beach, they're going to come around the jetty, they're going to yada, yada, yada. So when you're sitting at the jetty maybe in your boat and they're inside of it and their mullet are pouring down the jetty in front of you, you're gonna probably want to be presenting your baits the same, you know, same general direction. Just just as kind of a rule, but like I said, there's no rules. Match the hatch. Match the hatch and, and you can't go wrong. 
you know, it's hard to go wrong with some mullets or a mullet looking lure. So. Is there any weather pattern or wind pattern or something that makes them back up some? Or? If you get a hard south, it'll, it'll slow them. Usually they're going to keep going. But they still? They're going to keep going. They've, of the time yep, the they've, got a, they've got a mission, and their mission is to get south before it gets cold. So it's, it's a, you know, a, a, a strong southerly or a storm or something like a big swell might pause them or slow them a bit, but really I don't think they ever will go actually reverse and then shift back down. Who's to say what's going to happen in the next 10 to 15 years, though, because it, it's a lot warmer here. And uh, if it does, who's, who's to say what's going to happen? They, you know, it might end up being that we're where they winter over eventually. You know, who knows? So it's um, every year changes, and every year is different. That's why we go with a, an idea of look to the last couple weeks of, uh, of August and any time after that until roughly Thanksgiving. Um, by then, it's done and over. If we've had a couple good hard cold fronts, it, it'll get moving quick. As soon as those cold, as soon as we actually get a real cold front that pushes through here, it's gonna get everything firing fast. Um, and everything goes quick at that point in time. If we have a real, basically winter or a real fall, which, you know, who knows what'll happen, so. Any other questions? Do you prefer uh, fish on high tide or low tide or morning <laughs> night stuff on the beach? The actual physical beach fishing, in the, any inlet or anything like that, I don't care if it's low going high, high going I want moving water. If it's anywhere around that dead, dead low or dead high, um, and until that switch happens, or and usually like the tail end of a tide before another tide turns when you're in an inlet, um, that tail end gets kind of lagging, everything's kind of slowed down, tide stops, and then all of a sudden everything changes because it flips and goes. On the beach, I like the apex of the tides, believe it or not, as opposed to the upcoming or the falling, or even working, uh, say, a high tide through the falling. Um, I like those apexes. I like the dead low, and I like also the dead high. Because what the dead low does is it sucks all the water down, and you have every, every the very last bit of, of break and everything. You've got a lot of little troughs that are exposed, and there's a lot more um, confused water. Uh, for a lot longer of, a, of an area. And the more confused the water is, the more confused the bait are, the more, uh, the more productive a fish is. Um, the, the less ability a bait has to see that snook sitting there, the more chance that snook has to eat. Um, so at dead high tide, it's a little different. The clean water pushes in. If there's not big surf, it usually eliminates any break whatsoever except for right on the beach. A lot of times at the high tide, most of your fish will feed within the first 10 feet of that actual break. They'll be running along the last trough, the last, the first little roll, that very first trough goes back and forth, a little bit cleaner of water, more of a patrolling kind of scenario. Whereas I find in the low tide, they'll get hunkered down into these troughs where it can go at low tide, you can be walking out for 15, 20 feet and you're in ankle deep of water. Well, then it goes down to thigh deep well, then it pops back up to ankle deep, just so, you know, you're in that, and it really, uh, it really kind of, uh, just like low tide, honestly, in the backwaters of, of anywhere where you have tidal flow, it concentrates larger fish into the deeper pools. So uh, a lot of times that low tide um, is when you get some really, really good fishing. High tide's a lot more, like I said, they're more in a, I feel in a cruisy mode, so they're just kind of moving up and down, maybe pick up a school mullet and hit them for a little while, then cruise back up the beach and hit them for a while, as opposed to sit and stay and lay down. A uh, good representation of that is typically, um, uh, the Cocoa Beach Pier can be really good sometimes. Um, high tide can be great. Sometimes low tide at the Cocoa Beach Pier can be the best. There's all kinds of really funky little troughs, and it pins those fish into those troughs or up into the pier or somewhere where they have enough water to physically be um, and those baits are still washing over, and it's giving them a little bit more of an advantage. So definitely like that. And then we'll go back. <laughs> As a rule, sunset, sunrise, sunset, or sunrise, sunset um, is going to be a good bite. If there's mullet moving through, I don't care what the tide is, I don't care what's going on. 
Uh, it could be purple skies and raining. It's probably going to go off if there's bait. Um, other than that, you're definitely going to want to pay attention more to the tides. Um, so if you only had a you know mid morning or whatever that you could fish, your prime time would be a dead high tide to walk the beach or a dead low tide to walk the beach. If you really wanted to select out a certain time to go do it, you can never be early in the morning and late in the evening. It's when fish feed the most. Uh, fish that have the ability to feed in the light get their first chance. Um, some fish sleep. Not all of them, but some fish actually rest during the night. They wake up, they're hungry just like we are, and they want to go at it. Um, you know, same with as night falls, fish that aren't as adapted to feeding in dark or in, in, in you know, low light situations, they'll shut down. They won't feed as much, or they'll go to other areas where they can scavenge or do whatever they got to do. Um, whereas some fish turn on. Uh, sea trout are one of the few that have, it's, and a lot has to do with the, um, your eyes. So certain animals have rods and certain people or animals, or I, I forget what we have. We have one or the other. Rods and cones. One helps you see at night, one helps you see during the day. Usually everything has one or the other. Sea trout have both. So they feed best at low light. That's why sea trout fishing is always the best in the early morning or early night or on a heavy cloudy day because they have an advantage. Um, fish that feed at night that, or heavy feeding at night, you know, they'll boom, they'll turn on. As soon as that, that's their advantage, they're on. You know, the guys that just finished, so everybody's wanting to eat, usually, in that early morning. Here. And that, you know, honestly, that early morning, to me, supersedes everything. Tide, early morning or late in the evening, supersedes tide, supersedes moon phase, supersedes everything. Um, it's time to eat, basically, for fish. So, you have one? You know, I don't. Um, the only glow, oddly enough, I don't even know if I have any in here. The only time I've ever really used much of a glow um, is the DOA shrimp for skipping up underneath mangroves and docks during the day, believe it or not. Um, for me, it, it, in my brain, it, it's, you know, it's dark. If you ever put on a mask and go under a dock or under a tree or under a, you know, a mangrove or whatever, you go from light, you know, sunny, to, uh, you can't see anything in that shadow. Once you get into the shadow, your eyes adjust, and you can finally see what's underneath that tree or underneath that dock. Um, it's kind of dark under there. It's kind of shaded. So I, 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 a lot of times I'll skip that DOA shrimp. But I don't typically do a glow lure, um, you know, like at night or anything like that, which, yet again, it's a standout situation. You're standing out from the crowd. Johnny on the outside is Johnny get eaten. Pretty much is what it is. Sorry if anybody's named John, <laughs> but um, you know that's just the way it is. If you're on the if you're on the outside, if you're different and you're in that school, you are getting eaten. Um, the whole idea behind like those the, the baits is, you know, in the bait schooling and that dense of a uh, of a of a pod is that it gives them the opportunity to make it somewhere without being odd man out. You know, you you out there by yourself just swimming, you're as good as as cook. So something like glow, um, a lot of times, I don't know if I even have one in there, um, I'll have a couple lip plugs that are a full-blown tiger stripe, chartreuse and, and orange and with the tiger stripe things down or pink or something like that, that really stands out. It's really completely opposite of anything they've been looking at, um, even though it might be in the same size range. So it's definitely worth a try. I'm a big one for try it all, especially if it ain't working and you know our fish are there, Keep on going, because you're going to find something that they're going to pee in on eventually. Um, snook have a bad habit of letting you know they're there, too. When the mullet run's going, they love to do backflips. They love to just, because they're sitting on the bottom, straight up through the bait, boom, and you'll see them flying out of the water. When it's really going, you will see snook flying out of the water. And it's, it's pretty, pretty insane. But a lot of times, you know, you get in that situation, you know those fish are there, you can't buy a hit even on a live mullet and you know jumping over to a glow or a, a full-blown tiger stripe or a you know pink chartreuse or something like that might give you the opportunity to get those fish that weren't going to hit otherwise anybody else yeah. you mentioned on your leader you use mono you use mono floor which one's better um i don't actually have a preference i think i have floro in there right now on both of them um i don't have a preference i honestly don't see any difference um the fluoro is a little stiffer to me. Um, but other than that, I really can't say that I get less hits on mono or more hits on fluoro. 
Um, it's honestly what's in the bag at the time and what I grabbed off the shelf. Um, a lot of times if I am fishing clearer water, I will go with a fluoro. Um, it does, if you lay this stuff in the water, and this is actually 60, um, mono has a shine to it that just is there. And the fluoro, whatever they do to fluoro it out, dulls that shine. Not all the way. You can still see it. It ain't disappearing. But it does dull it down a little bit. Um, but a lot of your fishing in this scenario, in the mullet run, is either on the beach or near jetty, and vision's compromised to get, you know. So you can actually get away with, you know, just about anything you want, um, even up to the 60. That's one of the good things about uh, the jetty or something like that is um, you can get away with that heavier tackle and uh, not, not have the potential to lose any fish. So, anybody else? Yeah, I have a, uh, you talk about clean water. Mm -hmm. Every time I see you go out now, the seaweed coming up the ocean is just a big thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, how will that affect the mullet? I don't necessarily think it'll affect the mullet run. And what you're talking about is all the sargasm yeah, washing up. Absolutely. And it's probably going to continue happening a lot more. Right. Um, which isn't a bad thing if you like offshore fishing <laughs> because it's really nice for doing some offshore fishing, but it sucks for fishing on the beach. Um, for us, it's terrible. For them, I think they could care less, honestly. You know? <laughs> it's a battle. There's really no stopping it. Um, that's, oh, you're right, Tom? Um, it's, it's one of those situations to where you almost have to go to live bait. No choice but putting out live baits, drifting them with the current, and just picking weeds off nonstop. Um, throwing any plug, even, it's not gonna work. You're gonna be weeded up before you get two cranks of the reel. Um, so you switch straight to live bait. And typically, you can pick your way through it. Sometimes it's so bad, you just can't, can't do anything with it. Usually though, once we get start getting the north to it, it tends to cut it down a little bit, um, keeps it out towards the Gulf Stream, um, and gives us kind of that clearer water. What we get is it's southerly and southeasterly, and that Gulf Stream is so close, dragging that stuff out of the Caribbean. It just has no choice but to dump it right on our beach. And it is here. It's here. It's like it's been bad actually. It just showed up a couple more, a couple days ago, uh, pretty good. But man, down south, they've had it like chest deep showing up on the beaches. It closed out uh, entire islands in the Caribbean. Um, they're not sure why exactly. It's breaking up a little bit more than it used to. Sargasm is an interesting creature. It's an, it's an algae. It's a, an algae, but a, it looks like a grass. And it prolificates when it has nutrients, and we put a lot of nutrients into the coastal waters these days. So no matter where you're at, don't matter if you're here or there or anywhere in between. Um, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's unfortunately something that happens. Um, luckily for us, usually it cycles, and especially if we get that change in something, it gives a, a, a break in it at the very least. But when in doubt, bait it out. <laughs> bait and wait, and you can kind of pick your way through. It's still tough, though. It is hard fishing. When that grass is real thick, it is hard fishing. Anybody else? I got one. Yeah? Alex, you're very involved with the conservation efforts mm -hmm. and uh, with what's going on. If you don't know, Alex is a champion of the lagoon. Go ahead. And if there's anything uh, we could do here as individuals to right. help further that cause and restore the lagoon to what it was, what could we do? Get educated about who you go into a booth and vote for. And if you don't vote, shame on you. I'm sorry to say it, but really, honestly, if you look at the numbers of people that actually vote in this country, it's pretty sad. Um, you know, if you don't do, if you do, understand who you're voting for. Um, other than that, uh, personal responsibility, I think, is going to be something that is kind of can take us in general to a different situation. Um, the it's not this, it's that mentality. Well, it's not this yard, it's, it's that sewer dump. It's not that sewer dump, it's all the septic. It's not the septic, it's all the crap that's been dumped in the ground on the Space Center and out on, uh, down in uh, Patrick. It's not that, it's, the, it's this, instead of it's that game, once that stops, we're in a different scenario. And that honestly comes down to personal responsibility. Understanding what your impact is, what your leaky car, what your fertilizer on your yard, your Roundup and stuff does, makes you more conscious as to what who you're voting for as to who it, it creates it starts a process and that process of personal responsibility honestly 
is what will take us to the next thing. Uh, the other one would be these guys right here. There's a few more. There he is right there's another one. The kids, um, if we're not going to fix it, it's a general, it's, it's a, an issue that's taken generations to happen. It's going to take generations to fix. Uh, my kids know much about that lagoon as I can possibly teach them and what should and shouldn't be happening to it. Um, and honestly, that's really going to be what it is. There is no quick fix for what we have in our lagoon. Um, it's not as easy as shutting off a lock like down south, um, although it's, even down south isn't that easy. Um, although, realistically, for the, the in everybody's face problem that they have in South Florida, you shut the lock, it pretty much stops. Um, years that they don't dump water are, are good years on St. Lucie or are good years in the Caloosahatchee. Um, the good years for us are going to come after a lot of really, really, really ugly hard work, unfortunately. Um, it's going to take, we grew wrong, very wrong, for a very long time. Um, we allowed the lagoon to be considered a place where we can just dump things for a very, very long time. Um, the releases that we hear about now of sewage and stuff like that are a drop in the bucket compared to what we've done over the last 60 years to this place. Um, there was a long time where they dumped straight in there and didn't, it didn't matter. Um, there was even still to this day, just so that when we go to our houses and there's a storm and it looks like it's gonna back up, they, every time that happens, they hit a button and it goes in. Um, and there's no stopping that. They do it to stop from backing up in our houses, but something tells me a little bit of backup in your house would kick that personal responsibility in real freaking quick. Um, put, put a couple inches of raw sewage in a commissioner's house and see how quick the uh, lift station gets fixed. <laughs> Just saying. Um, you know, it's, it really is. It's an unfortunate situation that we've um, gotten to a point to where we're at crisis levels, really, in, in our lagoon. Uh, the brown algae that we're dealing with, um, Ambryo laginus or some other crazy kind of ish Latin name like that, um, isn't going to just kind of magically go away. Uh, it's settled into several different areas, Laguna Madre and Baffin Bay in Texas being one of them. It's why it has the moniker, the Texas Brown Tide. Uh, that's the slang name for that algae, that species of algae. Uh, they've had it for 30 years. They had the longest continuous bloom, was about eight years of brown water. Um, they still have it to this day. It blooms. They do everything they can to knock nutrients back, and it helps curtail the issue. Um, so unfortunately, there is no easy answer to that. Um, the big one is, though, is the personal responsibility aspect and, and educating yourself and then being willing to actually talk to people and educate other people about it your neighbor sitting there dumping fertilizer on the yard right as it's getting ready to rain and he did it last week too you know it might piss him off a minute but hey dude you know that's literally going right into the lagoon no stop you know stuff like that and it's small um like i said it ain't one green yard it ain't one hoa that makes everybody have their their yards a uh, 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 color of emerald or something like that um, it's it's kind of all of us, and it, it's got to start being an all of us situation before it really changes. Because we're looking at some serious infrastructure fixing and stuff like that. I went to the meeting uh, that they had with the lady that was in charge of the, the, the lagoon restoration, mm -hmm. and they, they voted the money. And it's like, are you seeing much benefit from that yet? Or is the it the actual lagoon tax? Um, yeah, and and there is a pretty good breakdown of what they've been going, what they've gotten going on. Sadly, it takes so long to get some of these projects even started, permitted, blah, 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 that money's coming in and it's just basically sitting because it can't be spent yet. Uh, anybody who thinks that it's been used for AstroTurf or anything like that, we can go through all of it. It hasn't. Um, it's still sitting in a pot right there waiting to be used for the lagoon. Uh, there's a board of citizens that oversee the money. They don't have the end-all, be-all rubber stamp, which is something we want to work on eventually. Um, to where we have a citizens committee that has teeth that can actually put us to task or our, our leaders to task a little bit would be nice. Um, it's something we didn't get when they did it. However, the people that sit on that oversight committee are straight up you and me. I know several of them. They're business owners. They're parents. They're people that are just angry about the lagoon, and they're just us. They're not out to s stuff money in there. They get paid nothing. They put in hundreds of hours a month putting in time, doing research, 
and so just meetings. Now getting started. It is really it's honestly fun. just now getting started. And when we're dealing with what we're dealing with, we're dealing with stuff that's not a quick fix. It's all a long-term <laughs> goal. It's all a long-term, you know, deletion of nutrient load. Yeah, the plan she talked about was a 10-year plan. At least, at least. Goal. This is, when I first started, when I, or when I first started really freaking out at around 13, 14, when I realized that brown algae showed up and I realized what the brown algae was and I realized it wasn't just gonna go away and it was gonna only get increasingly worse um, when I started really researching it and looking at what our causes are to that nutrient load into this lagoon. I, the first time I really stood in front of the, the county commission and, started, and talked about it, I said, unless you sitting in front of me, people, five of you people, I don't care if it's your butt in that seat or another person, unless you guys are ready for several billion dollars 20 years of work and all of us getting really real about what's going on here, it's not going to change. And honestly, it stands true to this day. It's going to be 15 to 20 years of work, of hard work, of tearing up roads, of relining pipes, of doing a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff we didn't think about when we grew. My <coughs> neighborhood's one of them. It's terrible. I mean, I'm, I live in probably one of the worst neighborhoods that you could think of. I live on Merritt Island, right in central Merritt Island, and my house is on dredged up mangrove filter small you know a lot of our houses are on dredged up mangrove filter small and you know when you do that when you change the uh, eco ecology of an area to that extent um, when things start going wrong it's usually a long process to work them out but um, but thankfully we're starting to move forward on it and everybody's really understanding it's hard to not see now um, even for a long time, a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of scientists that have been looking at this lagoon for a long time were saying, hey, you guys, you guys have some pretty heavy nutrient load in here. The water's not going anywhere. We can see some issues. And they've been saying that for a long time. And uh, nobody listened until everything went brown, honestly. Well, yeah, the first week that flooded today was published, mm -hmm. 51 years ago. Yep. That first week, there was an article in the paper about we have to do something to about the lagoon. Banks. Uh, what has been done, that was 51 years yeah. ago. Today, the septic tank rules are identical to what they were. They're actually more years. lax. <laughs> you actually don't have to even get the thing inspected now. No. Not even when you sell your house, you don't have to get it inspected. And uh, so, I mean, but not to get too far into it, because we don't want to do Sorry, that. No. We don't want to Debbie Downer it. <laughs> but um, if, if anybody at any point in time has any question, one, about what we got going here, you know, with the, the mullet run or any type of fishing around, I'm really available, especially on social media. Um, if you look me up in any way, shape, or form, you're going to find me. Um, if you look up local lines or even Captain Alex Gritschke, you'll find me. Phone number somewhere, email somewhere. If you have any more questions about lagoon or fishing, get a hold of me. Get a, you know, send me a line. If you got some crazy idea or you got... Um, I mean, I, I get calls almost every day about the lagoon stuff, and um, I have a lot of people that have offered me all kinds of resources. Uh, and just like, just like with the, uh, uh, the stuff down south, I mean, it's taken years for people to get really revved up. Um, Captains for Clean Water has gotten a lot of traction in our world, our angling world, for the stuff down south. They've been there for a year, year and a half. It's been going on for 65 down there. Um, so. You know, everything takes a little bit of time. Um, there's some pretty motivated people right now, though. Um, and it ain't going to get better unless we get even more of motivated. So hopefully some changes will come. And, and just pay attention to what you do with your daily life and, and how you, and how you kind of look at the lagoon. So look at it, or look in it, not at it. Because for far too long, everybody looked at it and not in it. And then now what in it isn't so good. So all right, you guys, I think I'm going to cut it down. Free stuff, free stuff. Free stuff. Okay, so you're going to help me. You're okay. going to bring out the goods. Um, great, great. Yes, if anybody has any questions, um, Captain Alex has always been great to us. He's been around. If you can't find him or don't need a number, feel free to give us a call. We'll put you in touch with him as well. Um, and again, he comes and speaks at our CAM Expo. Mm -hmm. So we uh, totally, totally, totally love him. So we got a lot of goods tonight. Uh oh, look at all this. Normally stuff. we would do the prize wheel, but seeing since we've been here for a little while, and that's not a problem at all, we're just going to kind of draw names and numbers. Does everybody? Did anybody lose a ticket? Did somebody lose a ticket? Uh oh. Does somebody want the lucky ticket? Do you need a ticket? Okay, come on up. We'll get you a ticket. 
Okay, I'm gonna let you like pull prizes. How's that okay, sound? Sure, whatever. I can do it. Did I get a ticket? Yep. Let's get everybody tickets first. Who didn't get a ticket? I need to. And if I said, you, did, you didn't get registered, or you just come in late? Yeah, but, yeah, but he registered. No, I that's no, not I think a problem. Registered. Okay, wait. Perfect. Have so you, you got two? Yeah. You got two? There you go. Mm -hmm. Just more. We don't want anybody to miss out. Mm -hmm. One more. There you go. Who else do we have? Three more? Excellent. Hey, we just ordered shirts that color. You're going to see them. There's that one for you. That one for you. That one for you. Thank you so much. Was I supposed to get two or one? Just one, because the other one should be in there. But you weren't supposed to get two. No. Okay. Did you have two people in your heart? No. Okay. okay. Nope, you're good. I misunderstood. Okay. We have everybody? Very short. Okay, did everybody get the loyalty card that's supposed to have a loyalty card? Uh oh. We're good? Okay. Holy smokes. Well, oh, they can take one of those. Okay. Take one. One of these is for you. Would you like to have a visor? Thank you, Joe. Excellent. Okay, so we'll give away the visor then. We'll give it back. We got plenty of That's yours. All right. We got plenty of them. Yeah. Okay. So, our first giveaway is going to be the visor. Uh oh. Borders Exchange, we expect you to model this. Unless you want to model it. Go ahead and give it a draw. Take it as four, five, eight. Four eight one. Four eight. Would we have a four eight one? Hey! Yeah. Look at that. Everybody that hits, everybody that gets a prize tonight, we need you to stay around for a photo with Captain Alex before you leave. So don't get too excited and run off. Okay. Look at this. All right. Two VIP tickets to the Orlando Boat Show. Hey. Oh, oh. oh I hear some woo hoo hoos. Uh -huh. You can have a ticket and go spend a bunch of money on a boat. Exactly. Come see our booth. This is going to be four, five, eight, four, five, four. Four, five, four. Hey. Excellent. <laughs> it's a requirement. It's yeah, a you got, Yeah, you got to buy a boat when you go there. Okay, would you like to model our oh, towel series? Boaters Exchange and Yamaha. Okay, give us a drum roll. Uh, four, five, eight, four, five, two. Four, five, two. That's the ticket I gave you. Oh, no. So we have to redraw. Nobody's claiming that one. Why don't we just give it to him? He was a good Samaritan and gave us the ticket. There you go. You get a towel for being a good Samaritan. <laughs> there you go. You get to be February. Mr. February. We do have a January that's already volunteered. <laughs> All right. What do we got here? The okay, Yeti. Okay, we got a Yeti. I don't know. This is the Rambler. Your cold Coaster. State so that is four five eight four five nine. Four five eight four five nine. Anybody? Anybody go one? Anybody? Anybody? Uh, four four nine. Uh, you, let me see. Make sure four, you have four five, five nine. nine. I can read today. <laughs> okay, we'll redraw. Uh oh, going once, go going on. twice. Sold to somebody who left early before the draw. I bet you they. I bet you they had pizza and left. More than likely. More than likely. Yeah. So we got four five eight four six one. Oh. Hey. Okay. What else we got? We got, we got a sea deck. I like this. I feel, this I feel like, Do you feel it? Do you feel, who feels lucky? I feel like uh, Santa Claus or something. I know, right? Don't tell Paul we're giving away all his stuff. Four, five, eight, four, eight, four. That sounds a lot like that last one we just tried. Hey, look at that. <laughs> the last one's excellent. I, use, I actually got one of them things, and I use it for everything but step pads. I've put little foot pads on everything I can find to make sure it doesn't slip. You know, they look really, really cute when they put them on the paddle boards for the puppies. Oh, there you go. I've so the dog them. can hang out. Okay, right, we so got? we got a t-shirt. We got colors and sizes you can pick from. Boaters Exchange t-shirt. A shirt, a Boaters Exchange shirt of your choice for four, five, eight, four, seven, eight. Four, seven, hey. eight in the back row. Representing the back row. Excellent. Representing the back of the house. We're going to do some more? I'm we are. This. We are. What size? Schmedium? 
Oh. <laughs> medium. You need a large. Medium. Then we might have to go. Large. In blue? Do you like blue? Gotta work. Goes with your eyes. Thanks. There Excellent. You go. Okay, I think we should do a sun shirt. Okay. We got a sun, a nautic star. Anybody got a nautic star in here? A boat. Anybody? Whoa. Uh oh, here we go. Let's, Let's see how lucky you over. are. If not, yeah. they happen to be on sale this month. <laughs> right, Steven? We have a sale going on. <laughs> a little pre boat show sale. Yeah, there you go. It's four, five, eight, four, five, six. Four, five, six. Oh, up. showing up in the back of the house. We got black or we got blue? One's an XL. They all XL? I think it's a big one. That's right? 2 XL. Or you can go with a t-shirt. We'll give him a t-shirt choice. You got XL or a 2 XL, black or blue? XL black. XL black. Excellent. That's nice. Long okay. sleeves and all of them. Okay, what else do you think we got in here? I don't know. There's some more visors. Good stuff. How about... There you go. Check out. Does anybody like camouflage? Yeah. Any camo lovers? Yeah. How about a little Minn Kota camouflage? Right, let's do it. You pick this time. Okay. 439... Last three digits, four, three, nine. Oh, see, so you changed it up on me. Oh, hey! didn't we say? Good thing you got your ticket. I'm going to verify him. Oh, sure. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. What do you guys think we should do one more? Yeah, why not? Okay, what do you guys want to do? Do a combo pack here. We'll do a couple of these. You guys want a hat? You one want a visor? T shirt. Anybody? Boat? You want one? How about one of each? Yeah. yeah. Okay. There. And then give me a t shirt. This is going to be the grand prize. There we go. Grand prize. Grand prize. Okay. For all so, the biscuits. Okay, and just so you guys know, you got all stay so we can get a group photo. Do you mind? We'll oh, put Alex in the middle. Oh you my goodness. All, these... all the winner, winner, chicken netters? Yeah, exactly. Okay, here we go. Who's up? It's uh, 458, of course. 463. Hey! Big call. North side in the house. Yes, indeed. Excellent. All right. Okay, one quick photo. Thank you, everybody, for coming. There's koozies here. Feel free to take one if you'd like. Um, if you want to stick around and ask Alex some questions, we'd be love to be